Uh, for those who don't know me well, um, I am the daughter of two writers, so I sort of have it in my blood. It's sort of the family business, which is a blessing and a curse at the same time. Uh, professionally, I came up through the ranks as a newspaper reporter, a feature writer, column writer, but um, I discovered books, and books are my real love um, in life. Um, I should say, and this looks like I'm 80 years old, but just I'm really short, and even in heels, I can't, I can't get my handwriting well. So my company is rightdirections.com. I founded it oh, about 13 years ago, and it was a way to sort of gift forward the knowledge that I had accumulated over the years through my various uh, writing experiences. Um, I'm evolving. My website is changing. I'm telling you this because if you would go there now, it's not going to be that way in another few weeks. And I'm also going to launch, um, beginning of next year, the Right Directions Institute. And it's going to have lots of different kinds of writing classes. And that's why you have this little form if you would just rate these. Um, this way I know what should go in the queue and in what order. So my idea is to give people structured learning and progression. Um, not necessarily to discover who they are as a writer, but really to get projects out of the door. That's, that's my goal. Hello. We're going to give you one of the, oh, there, you can take that. Oh, no problem, no problem. So um, keep your eye out for that, and you'll learn more about it. Um, this is the first book I ever wrote. It was for the Adolf Kors Company, and it was one of these things that I just stumbled into. I was in uh, graduate school. I had just had um, my first daughter. I was really, really poor, and my dean took pity on me. And somebody at Coors needed a book written about cans. And she asked me if I would write it. I had absolutely no interest, but it was Coors, which meant there was money. And um, I was really poor. I was at the University of Colorado in Boulder, and Coors was just down the road in Golden. So it turned out to be an incredible, incredible project. And the scoop behind this was uh, Coors was one of the real leading forces in the development of the recyclable can, aluminum can. They really, along with Reynolds, pretty much uh, invented the industry. And all of the people in the 50s and early 60s who had worked on the project were literally dying off, and they wanted to grab their stories and put it together into something they didn't know what. And even though I didn't know about books, I wrote a book. And uh, I was initially supposed to just interview about 10 people or so. And by the time I was done, I interviewed probably about 50 people, including the president of the company, Bill Coors, because this was his baby idea. But uh, this was my first book. It's a collector's item now. I just got an email last week from a metallurgist who was trying to get a copy. And there really are none around except in libraries. But what I didn't know then that I know now is that I was actually writing a book for a business to promote a business. So even though they were using it to capture people's stories, there was a promotional value in that. And somehow, intuitively, I understood that. And so I turned it into a book that also included the history of can making and how you can go back to the Napoleonic era. And then the history of cores, Adolf cores coming over from Germany. And uh, I got to, because they had a really good uh, budget, I got to get original pictures and all sorts of things uh, through Getty Images and Library of Com Congress. And you graphic designers will appreciate this. I got to do it in six color, I guess with spot color, silver. So I could do uh, what I wanted. And I hired, um, I had no idea how to do this, so I hired a graphic designer. And so from the very my very first book, I got to manage a project. And that just really got me thinking about how books can promote a business. So we're going to talk about traditional publishing and self-publishing. I'm going to tell you my bias absolutely up front, and it's here. I think this day and age, particularly if you're an entrepreneur or a solopreneur, don't even go near here. Okay, so I'm just telling you, that's my bias. I'll walk you through what this means, and then I'll tell you why I feel that way. So there are five things that we're going to touch on today. The first is, why write a book? Because that's a really important question. It's not something that you do overnight, so it's going to take, um, 
I put skill at the bottom of the list of things that you need, and I don't say that in any kind of flippant way. Skill is really kind of at the bottom. You don't have to write a great book. There's something about a book when it gets into print that transforms it, that makes it just read better and sound better. And a lot of times books um, serve a different purpose. They don't have to be a great read. So skill is kind of at the bottom. But there are reasons why we need, uh, why we need to know why we're writing it. And we'll talk about that in a second. Uh, what is a book? I think it's really important to expand your notion of what a book is because it gets you that much closer to publishing one. We'll talk about that. Book publishing, traditional versus uh, self-publishing. And this is where I think I really get you on my side. Um, how to recycle your book, all the different ways that you can do it. And I know when I work, uh, when I mentor people, coach people, help people uh, get their books out the door, um, I do a lot of project management and I do a lot of ghostwriting. Um, I never just look at the book. We have to be able to recycle it in X number of ways. It's really a waste. Um, it's kind of like getting an outfit, uh, a, a, a suit, and not mix and matching it. It really is a waste. Uh, and then we're going to come back to this, why write a book, okay? Because it's really important that we come full circle. So uh, let's get some, some feedback here, some people giving some ideas of why write a book? What, why do such a thing okay. to yourself? What else comes to mind? Passion about an idea. Okay, so passion about an idea. Self-expression, okay. Now, I'm going to say, let's change it a little bit. Self-expression is fine, but why write a book to build your business, okay? okay. So let's, let's do it that way. Okay, what's that? Tell a story. Tell a story. How would that relate to your business? It's promoting your business. Okay, so let me use the word promote. Yeah, promote your business. Okay, promote business. Okay, tell me a little bit more about that. What do you mean by credibility? Okay. Mm -hmm. okay, anything uh, else? I had a few. Uh, marketing, market your business, public relations. Uh, depending on what your book is about, you might have a hook. If let's say you have a book about Kennedy, John Kennedy, now is a good time of year to put it out. So if it's a holiday book, if it's a book about summer things for kids and you run a child care center, that might be a good time. Marita knows all about this kind of stuff, of taking a book and hooking it into an editorial calendar. Expertise. Some people want fame and fortune. The fortune part, uh, we need to, um, I need to pull you in a little bit about that, okay? Uh, because that doesn't necessarily mean you're going to make any money by the, you don't necessarily make money on writing a book uh, directly. It's the indirect ways that you make money that are most important. What the book gives you uh, that brings business uh, in, and I'm a real good example of that. Um, you want to create a product. Books are products. I sell books. My clients sell books, so they're standalone products. Uh, Self-examination, I think this one is really interesting. When you write a book that is for your business, it will really show you what holes you have, where your knowledge is, where your knowledge is not, what you have ready to put out there and what's not quite ready to put out there. Because you have to do a little bit of soul searching, not just into yourself but into the business and what your purpose is. And it's a really interesting way of getting some perspective of your, of your business. Um, Let's see, share information. And never, never be concerned if the information you want to share is already out there. Every year there are, I don't know how many thousands of books coming out on diets, but every year there are new ones because people want new information, but because there's also a twist. It could be the South Beach diet, it could be the water diet, it could be whatever diet it is. So never hold yourself back if you think that your book has already been done because it hasn't, because you haven't written that particular book and your voice and the way you come at something is what makes it um, unique. Uh, you might want to further a cause. Um, I ghost wrote a book a few years ago for a man who wanted to bring light to <clears throat> 
sexual abuse of children. He had been sexually abused as a child, and he was launching a not-for-profit, and he wanted to finally come public with his story and use that as a fundraiser and as his uh, kickoff. So he had a particular uh, cause. Um, this is uh, really important to me. Uh, it kind of goes along with credentials, uh, but books literally have a shelf life. Business cards, brochures, magnets, pens, they all disappear. But a book, people feel a little guilty about tossing a book. Okay, so already you have the guilt factor working for you. But there's something about handing somebody a book that's real different than you saying, here, go get it on Amazon as a download. Okay, we'll talk a little bit about uh, e-publishing. But for now, let's use as our reference only books that you can feel. So imagine that um, Don says to me, or Harriet, since you're both photographers, oh, here, you can go to my site and download you know, these JPEGs. I'll give you permission. What's the difference between that or you come up to me and say, hey, I'd like to work with you, or I'm really glad you gave me this opportunity to do your wedding. Here's a book of my photographs as um, a gift. And all of us can do that as freebies. So this is a marketing tool I think um, really can't be beat. And by the way, I don't know how much magnets are in hundreds and hundreds uh, uh, per unit cost. It's a heavy shipment. Hmm? It's a very heavy shipment. Whatever it is. It, whatever it is, it's a heavy shipment. <laughs> There's always a shipment, but we're going to talk about this here, which is one of my books. It's of quotations, and it's sort of a, a little sister book to The Art of, of Schmooze. And this book cost me about $1.54 to produce. Okay, so you compare this to a magnet, and I'll tell you how I got it down to that price, because I want to I wanna open you up a little bit to, um, to not shutting off that a book is too expensive. It really is not. The expense comes with some, there's always the intellectual labor, the in, you know, thinking about the book and actually doing it. But I'd like to, and remind me, like, this is where I don't know how much we can get into um, ways that you can uh, fast track that and kind of create filler. Um, know too that this class, because I can't get to everything, I want to give an expanded version of it because I would like to kind of work with all of you to start beginning to create a, uh, a timeline, contents, and all of that. So we'll see, we'll see how far we can um, go. So we have, uh, we have reasons for writing a book, and what um, is not here, and as a final thing, is just because you want to, period. You just want to write a book. One thing that's really great about self-publishing is you do not need anybody's permission to go ahead. You just do it. Screw them. Okay? And that's really important. As a writer, I can tell you it's rough. It's, it's not fun um, at times because it's, you, know, you put yourself out there and you make yourself really vulnerable. And it certainly helps when you know that you don't have to jump through somebody else's hoop to do it. It changes the equation. And when you have ownership of something, all of a sudden it's your book. The way you treat it and the way you market it and all of this kind of stuff, what you get out of it is um, pretty interesting and pretty wonderful. Okay, so let's talk about uh, what is a book. And I brought some samples today. So um, this is... A book. Thank you. Thank you all. Come on. Play with me, people. I know. You thought that was, a, that was not a trick question. Okay. All righty. Um, this is... You are so darn fast. Wow. What a mind. Can I answer the next one? A book? No, it isn't. It is, actually. Just want to freak you out. It's a little, thank you. It's petite. It's petite. It's petite. This one, and you, uh, you photographers uh, might want to, these are postcards. This is a book, and this I love because that's my father's book. Look at that from the, uh, from the uh, 50s. Tough kid from Brooklyn when they used to, uh, the uh, Hardcover was called Spit in the Stars, but when they go to softcover, uh, they have these like dime bookstore type things. And so if you knew my father and knew this cover, it's like a joke. But anyway, this is, um, this is a book. 
this is a book, okay? And the reason it's a book is because I'm writing it as a book. I could sell this as a book. It doesn't have to have a binding. According to the copyright office, I can put my name on here and this is a book. It belongs to me, it's intellectual property. One of the things that I really like about self-publishing is you can do all sorts of neat things in terms of a book. What you need, and this is where I think I got Kimba on board, is to, uh, and I think even the technology has uh, changed where you don't even need this number of pages, you need 32 sheets of paper or 64 pages in order to, at least the uh, printer I've, I use, uh, for the book to be able to hold the glue on the binding, okay? That's 64 pages. That's not a whole lot of pages to fill because you can have an awful lot of white space. And one of my favorite stories about white space is being online at Barnes & Noble and there was this book and it was like $25. It was leather, it was really beautiful and it's called, it was called something like Everything Men Know About Women. I thought, oh, what the hell? You know, so I open it up and it's totally blank. Yes, so no offense, that was very sexist, I'm sorry. But the point of the story, yes, the point of the story is this woman sold about 150,000 copies. And so your book doesn't even have to have a whole lot of stuff in it, okay? Uh, quotations, you know, these books don't have a whole lot uh, in them. That doesn't mean quotations are necessarily easy to write if you have a really good quotation collection. Um, to strut my stuff a little bit, this is one of my specialties and many of uh, my books, the majority of them are quotation and meditation collections and it's, it, there's an art to it. But in terms of layout and design, this is really easy and these are just dingbats and you can, you can do a whole lot. Um, this is an interesting model for a book. This was a client of mine, uh, Cherie Nudd, and she has a website uh, called Designs for Giving. And uh, she was a big whoop de doo uh, fundraiser. And so every year for donors and other people, they would uh, give books. Well, they would give the magnets and all of this. And she had an idea that she wanted to give a book of quotes. And so we walked through the process of how to do it and she uh, hired a designer. But this is what's interesting. She still has her company. This is called Living a Life of Significance. She always saw it as a series, and so she has living a life of courage, living a life of abundance. And what that means is she not only got down sort of the, the uh, format, you know, the first time you do something, and you know, there's the learning curve, so she way flattened the learning curve. This way, as a series, she could go to hospitals and she would sell this individually, and she had a lot of contacts in the field. She can say, hey, here's for this year, here's next year. And um, so she, excuse me, sells quite a bit of them. Now this is where she got really clever. And this is where um, print on demand, which we'll talk about a little bit later, um, self-publishing comes in. Because what she did was she offered uh, hospitals, uh, or you know, she works with not-for-profit health, uh, healthcare fundraising. And so what she did was she said to them, you know, I will give you this book, and in fact, instead of this cover, my name, let's put your name on it. Let's say XYZ Hospital, all right? So they said, great. Now for her, the inside of the book stays the same, and the only thing that changes is she has to change the cover, a few words, and then get a new cover proof, which cost her $15, okay? So for $15, all of a sudden, she came up with real specialized uh, publications, which is something, um, Certainly you two can actually, you guys here, um, can do, all right? Then it got even more interesting. She could then also say to, um, let's say the president or whoever it was at the foundation who was giving books away, here, tell me, let's put a message in there from you, personal, personal message. And then she could do that and then she would just get a new proof. And the new proof is what was like 15 cents a page, it was nothing nothing when you're selling these for like six, eight, ten dollars a book. And so every once in a while, you know, she'll get dozens of orders and a few times she's gotten well over a thousand. So this is sort of an interesting thing that you can um, do. So this is a book that um, in some ways is a shell. It's the same book, okay. 
Um, let's see what else I want to tell you at uh, this point. Is that the recycle concept? Yeah, we're going to get into that um, more, but I just want to uh, show you, well, that's recycle. I just want to show you this. So you have two books here. This one is 32 pages, and this one is um, probably about 104. Okay, which book is more expensive? The one on the left because all the colors. It's color, and also because it's saddle stitched, which is, um, you know, we tend to think, well, it's just stapled. And I don't know how it is for some of the things you do, but for this particular book, it was six bucks a book. Okay, and it is color. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that's this, where this book, um, this book was um, a little bit over four. Okay. So don't make assumptions sort of about anything. And we'll get into the self-publishing, because basically when you do these print-on-demand where you just get the number of books you want, usually there's a minimum order. The place I use, it's 25. You can't go wrong with 25 copies. Um, the price breaks aren't great. I mean, you're really not going to see a whole lot of savings. Between maybe 50 and 300, you'll see a little, you know, something. But um, when you get into the larger quantities, you have to go into a different process. And you guys could, you know that more, and maybe you guys can um, grab them. So anyway, a book is um, a book is a lot of stuff. And just kind of think more broadly um, about that. Okay, so now we'll do traditional publishing versus uh, self-publishing. So in the, everything is changing so quickly, it's mind-boggling, and anything I tell you today is going to be different tomorrow, and if I would have given this class a year ago, it would have been different. And certainly, uh, when I started Right Directions about 13 years ago, there was no such thing as print-on-demand. And then it just, the, it, it's unbelievable uh, it's sort of like workers of the world unite, writers of the world unite. We can, it's our world, it's our game, we can do um, what we want. Um, so with traditional publishing, the way it worked was, and I'm going to take this off so I can show this in another way. Okay, so let's say, I'm just going to say that this is your book idea, okay? It's not even, uh, it's not even a book yet. Okay. Um, you need to go through, you used to have to go through uh, some gatekeepers in order to get your book uh, out the door. So sorry for my handwriting again. Okay, so let's say you have an idea that would be similar to what you guys are working on. Let's say it's nonfiction. You had an idea for a book. You wouldn't write your idea, the whole thing down, because um, honestly, it's sort of a waste of time. You would write what's called a book proposal. And a book proposal basically is a business plan for your book. It's uh, what your book is about, who the audience is, you have uh, a table of contents, a paragraph or so for each. You have uh, a marketing plan, what you plan to do with it, who you uh, give it to, who your audience is, all this kind of stuff. If there are any uh, special things that you need to produce the book, like maybe you have to go to Europe and take lots of pictures, that kind of thing. So you do a formal book proposal. And uh, usually you have a, a cover letter and you have the proposal. And the proposal, depending on uh, the, the agent you're working with, it could be anywhere from five pages and one chapter, or it could be like the first three chapters, whatever it may be. So you do have to have something written. Um, and then you sort of pick and choose which chapters that you would um, give. All right. So let me just take you over here just for a minute. If you are writing uh, a fiction book, okay, the book needs to be completed. So here, you only need a proposal because you're going to go through a lot of gatekeepers. It's a nonfiction book, and it's marketed differently. A fiction book, 
you have to write the whole thing. Okay. Because you can't just say, oh yeah, this is a really good book, and you know, hey, like in chapter one, you know, trust me on chapter two, it's great. You can't. You have to have the whole thing done. Okay. And again, you'll sell, uh, you'll send sample chapters. Either way, and again, this is just sort of, you know, kind of the basic structure. Either way, the way the, gate, the gatekeepers work is first you have an agent. And the agent, uh, theoretically, is someone who can tell whether the book idea is good, and the agent knows different publishers and where to send that book. Um, so here's gatekeeper number one. You first have to get past the agent. Agents aren't licensed in any way, and there's some people that I can, my, my uh, dog can hang out a shingle and say, I'm an agent. Anybody can these days. And um, these guys are really hurting, too, because of self-publishing. People are circumventing them as well. So then the agent goes and finds the publisher in an ideal world, finds the editor, the publisher, just the right publishing house for you. Now, um, actually, this goes here. Now, a publisher um, has a relationship with the agent, theoretically. And so we'll trust what the agent says. But the publisher is not going to say, hey, I love this. A publisher is going to call in the marketing and sales force because these are the people who have to market and they're people who have a lot of control over whether that book will be accepted into the publishing house or not. And library sales are really big. I think um, they're like 40% of the market. So um, that's how that works. Now, your control is given over ultimately to the publisher. The agent will probably have you do some work on a proposal because they want it to look good. They want it, uh, they want themselves to look good. But when you have the publisher, um, the publish go publisher is going to decide the title and the length. And anything that you have here, they might run with and then they might not run with it. You sort of no longer own that idea. What they want is the marketing and promotional value out of it. Because there's kind of like this 2080 rule. Um, and this might be uh, old, because who knows from last year or three years ago. Um, basically, 20% of the books that are there, and it used to be that authors would get a decent advance to begin work on their books. Only 20% of books actually make back their advance. And this is where most of us will be. And this 20%, if you're giving, let's say, Bill Clinton um, $10 million or Hillary Clinton money to write a book, every, every marketing effort is going here. And so nothing much is going here, and advances have really shrunk down and all this kind of stuff. But what this means to me as a business is this. If you're writing a book for a particular reason, to grow your business, promote your business in some way, you don't have time to mess around with this stuff. Okay? This process is going to take you usually between like 9 and 18 months, maybe 6 to 18 months. Okay? So if I were to say to you as a business, okay, I'm going to tell you what your business is. I'm going to tell you how to market it. I'm going to tell you what to say and to whom. And I'm going to do all of this for you. You maybe will make some money because I'm going to pay you a commission, a royalty. But I'm only going to pay you royalty after I pay your agent, after I meet all of my expenses, after I give your agent about 20%. Then whatever is left over for you is what you are going to get. But you need to come up with a marketing plan, your own marketing plan, because you know we kind of can't do this for you. OK, so as a business, you can see that, well, I'm already doing a marketing plan. I know what it is I want to say. And I'm not waiting 18 months. It's like somebody saying to you, I'm sorry, you have to wait 18 months before you can grow your business. So I am a big advocate for self-publishing because you control the message, you control the medium, and you control your time frame and who you're going to work with on it. And it's really important to have the control. We're all in business because we want to be. We're not, we didn't come in here to, I don't think, to make a killing. There's something about sharing who we are, what we do, that has significance for us. And we want to be true to that. So I don't like this model at all. I like the self-publishing model. Um, as you guys probably maybe can reassure some of the people here, it, it is really not as expensive as you think. 
the actual products, the books themselves, are not the cost. I mean, that's not where the cost is. The cost is, at least from my perspective, is hiring some really talented people to do your cover and your design. That's where your cost is, and it's worth every uh, penny to do that. So you want um, a nice cover. This one won an Addy, and this one won an Addy. Um, and uh, anyway, you can, you can see that it, it really elevates um, a book. I'm lucky in that when I started the newspaper business, and I'm aging myself here, it was right when um, newspapers were going to desktop publishing. And I learned how to desktop publish on a Mac because that's how my stories would get into print. And so I had, um, and I still c can desktop my own books, but only after designers come in and create like a template for me. So there's some things that you might be able to do um, on your own. Um, but if you're doing a series of books, this is kind of cool because you can just take the artwork, recycle it so that you can have, you know, use yellow instead of red. Um, you can have a series of books, um, you know, that are, are similar, maybe just a little different piece of um, artwork. Well, there's always distribution, but I tell you, things are really changing. If you want to be distributed, get on Amazon. You know, um, everything is really changing. Amazon is its own thing. Um, it's pretty rough out there with Amazon. Um, I've lost money on books through Amazon because they take 55% of what the cover is. And by the time you get to finishing your printing, shipping and handling to you, and then shipping and handling to them, um, it could be that you make no money um, or very little. So, uh, depending on the goal, that may be okay. Uh, yeah, but yeah, it's it's important. I rethink it. I go back and forth with Amazon. That's a, a whole other conversation because it's um, if you're not on Amazon, you don't exist. But there are there are sort of ways that you can get around the um, the formal structure. And that's, that's a whole thing. I'm going to teach a class on self-publishing of ways that you can kind of sneak your book in through marketplace and other ways to get more money. And um, I'll just say one thing because I'm very biased. You have to be very careful of these places that are a one-stop shop because of the way the um, sort of royalty structure is and who owns what. If you own what's called the ISBN number, an ISBN number is basically a book social security number. and um, you know, for the most part, every if you're a self-publisher, you don't have to have one. It depends on how you use the book and uh, the um, the way that you sell the book. But whoever owns the ISBN number really owns the book, and a lot of these places will assign an ISBN number, and that means that they basically have the social security number for your book. And if you want to reprint it, you have to go through them, and you are paying a whole lot more than if you had done it yourself. So um, I'm biased. I haven't um, done a book that way. So um, I might be really wrong, but for other companies, um, you don't get me started. Really, I get really um, <laughs> upset. So, okay. That yeah, that's uh, <laughs> that's right. Yeah, with a glass of wine or something to uh, <laughs> sedative, you know, to calm me, <laughs> calm me down. Okay, so um, let's talk a little bit about how you can recycle a book. So these are some interesting ones. So this is a beloved client of mine. Her name is Sarah Stupp, and Sarah has autism. And it's uh, severe autism. She cannot speak, but she uh, would type with an old Canon keyboard, and now we just got her an iPad, so that's sort of interesting. She's learning how to use that. So years ago, she wrote a children's book, and through a grant, I think it was the Department of Rehabilitation Services, and I work uh, through the state on a grant to uh, help her. Um, it's been an ongoing contract. So she wrote this kid's book. Well, uh, she just finished up a book for middle age, uh, middle school students, and um, it will be out in the, um, kind of in the spring. But this was years and years ago. I think this was like 2000 and, well, we reprinted in 2008, <laughs> but I think it was like 2005. But Sarah can't produce other books. So what we've done is we've recycled. And one of my jobs as sort of the editorial uh, consultant, marketing ed editorial marketing person, is to come up with products for her. 
She also wrote this book, and this was the first, she did this before I met her. This is the first book I did with her. And what her mom did, Sarah's been writing ever since she was uh, a kid and literally learned how to write. Her mom came over and got, brought me literally a stack like this and said, here are all of her writings since she was a kid. Can you make a book out of this? And it was so darn cool. And it took me a number of weeks, but I took all of those pages and I sat on my bed and on the floor and I spread things out and put them into piles and then reduced the piles. This is a beautiful book, by the way. I mean, it's not, it, she talks about the experience of autism, but she also has all these just beautiful quotations and things about love and family. It's really remarkable. But she can't, you, you can't say to her, do more, because you never know whether she can write or not or you know, whether she wants to. So I had to come up with other products for her. So one of the things we did was we took some of them and we turned them into just little collections. This one is Heart and Spirit, Words to Comfort, Inspire, and Share. We did one on family life, just pulling things out. Um, so this is a way that you can recycle. We took this, and um, this is the coolest thing, and it's coming out um, before the holidays hit uh, Christmas, is I turned this into um, a stage play, the book, and we turned it into a CD, um, which has all sorts of fun sheets that are based on this book and an audio version <laughs> of the book. And I also turned this, um, and this was really cool, I got to create a movie, an iMovie, and I made a movie of it. So all of this is recycled from someone who cannot produce other, other books. I told you about recycling here. Okay. Um, the other uh, thing I want to tell you about with recycling that's kind of interesting is you guys go over and over the same material with clients, uh, with customers, whoever it may be, and you might not know it yet, but you already have a lot of written material. It's in here maybe, not on paper. Um, so the genesis of books is kind of interesting. So this book, The Art of Schmooze, um, as a newspaper reporter, I would do lots and lots of interviewing. And then I began teaching people and holding classes on some techniques to get people to talk to you. And then I don't know how or why it started turning into The Art of Schmooze about talking to people. And once I had that title, I started kind of like riffing on it and started adding material. But this book was written because I had gathered all of this sort of intellectual stuff in here that began to take shape in here. It's the same thing with um, this book, Fearless Creativity, that I put together, which is basically, um, I'm not going to say the culmination, but has all of these uh, exercises from classes that I've taught, one-on-one -on -one mentoring, coaching people, and just putting them into writing form. And a lot of these just started as handouts that I started just putting together into, um, into a book. Uh, do you know the book, uh, What Color Is Your Parachute? Yes. Okay. Well, that book just started as a bunch of photocopied paper. So I forget the name, Bowles, B-O-L-L-E-S, I think his name is. And so over time, he would get more and more paper and more and more paper. And so then he kind of put it together, maybe with a binder clip or whatever. And then I guess at some point, people started asking for it. And he thought, geez, hmm, maybe I can do something with this. And he produced What Color Is Your Parachute? And that thing, a, a new edition, I think, if it doesn't come out every year, probably comes out every few years. It's one of these perennial books. So start paying attention to some of these little snippets of paper that you have. Um, one of the things that I'm using and uh, Kim and I both use is uh, Dragon. I use it a lot on the treadmill in the morning uh, because I sit there and I get my best ideas in the morning. And instead of writing things down with Dragon, you can dictate it. It's voice recognition. It's goofy. It's really goofy. If you don't look at it soon after, you don't know what the heck you said because it's all the words are, are off. But um, that's a way of sort of taking these notes. And this is uh, that's Dragon the stuff. The good one on your desktop is much clearer. Okay. Much better. Yeah. The free version. Yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah you can do that. But it's right. The 
trying it naturally speaking, the one on your desktop, you can just speak into it, and it's a very, really good dictation program. The free one that we use on our phones is, is free, so it's limited in its ability. But the one that's on your computer is really good. You can also write emails and letters, and you can tell it to do searches. It works with just about any program. Yeah, it's really pretty incredible. The audio is, is really important, too. What I like about Dragon is I don't first have to listen and then transcribe in any way. So that's really um, pretty wonderful. So um, anyway, so that's how I have all of this. And some of this has turned into this and will turn into this at some point. Um, I want to. I want to go back, and I, I want. We're going to have to wrap up, but I want to go back to uh, costs for a minute because I picked up this book. This is really cool. I love shortcuts. So, this book. Yeah. Okay. So this. Uh, I tend to do five and a half by eight and a half, just because when I pull something out of the printer, I can see a whole page spread, and it's a little bit less expensive if you do like a six by nine book, not very much, but just a little bit. If you do something that's more of an odd size, it will cost you a little bit more money. But um, so I had this quotation book that I wanted to put out. I didn't want this form format, and I thought, hmm, this is interesting. What if I put two of them on a page when I sent it to the printer? run them at the same time, and have the printer just trim them for me. So all of a sudden, this book, which cost me three something, like this, cost me one something, cost me half the price. So depending on the size you have, you might be able to do some interesting things with your books that really reduce um, the costs. And see, these are things that traditional publishers can't do for you. If they're going to charge six ninety five, why don't you charge six ninety five? Okay. I can't tell you how many writers I've met who have not made um, money or have made very very little, and it's a really painful story, really painful. I was at a conference a few years ago, and a woman who was a best selling writer came over to me. I was talking about self publishing, and she came over and uh, she admitted it took a while that she had made um, just about nothing on her book, but she was a New York Times bestseller. And that's because everybody took a cut, but also uh, getting on the New York Times from what she said that sometimes it's not really um, that it's that different publications and publishing houses have different notions of what a bestseller is. So a bestseller might be ten thousand, bestseller might be a million. I don't know. That's at least what she said. So this is all of that. I want to come back, and I'm willing to hang around uh, here. We've really gone over um, a whole lot of stuff. And let's come back to this, our last thing. This is not a good one. Why write a book? So this, to me, is the biggie. If you're going to take anything out of here um, today, and this is where I also am sort of biased that um, we are all, and this is where I get sort of nuts and berries, okay? Um, we're all on this earth for a reason, at least I think so. Some people might say it could be God, spirit. I don't know. I call it purpose with a capital P. I don't need to know what that purpose is. I just have a sense that I'm here um, not to complain, at least, okay, and not to uh, look a gift horse in the mouth, so to speak, that I'm here with some talents and some skills that I've developed and with a whole lot of love. And that's what I want to bring to my books. I want to bring the best of myself. Um, whether I succeed or not, I don't know, but I try. I try. And all of you here have something um, unique, if only because you are unique. And this part, this is really me saying what I truly, truly believe, that if you have good intentions, pure intentions, you have something to say, don't let anyone stop you from saying that and from expressing who you are. And if you can, don't worry about who will, who's going to read this book. Um, because that is not um, the question that's important right now. You will read the book. 
And if you, this is how I always picture in my mind, if I'll read the book, then there's got to be at least one other person other than my mother who will. Okay? So. Um, what? You have to get it to them. Yeah, but you're, like here, you're, uh, we talked about books as gifts. You work with an awful lot of people. You have, you give them a book, and this is where they can um, reorder. Oh, and here's the thing I didn't mention. My books, they don't make me a lot of money. That's not why I publish them. I publish them because I want to. But those books, they get me jobs. They get me jobs. Rightdirections.com, my books, people look at it, they just see my name and go, oh, okay, I'll hire you. These books, and this is another way of recycling, um, this is one of my, um, well, I, a lot of my, quote, one of my quotation collections, one of the first that I did years and years ago, um, that was the basis of some keynote speeches. You never know. I'd rather get in front of that audience than try to, you know, sell one or two here or there. Um, the other thing, too, and this is with recycling, for those of you who ever do public speaking or go into groups, you, um, Sometimes people don't want to pay you or pay you what you think you're worth. But it's really interesting that they'll pay for materials fees. And sometimes you can make a whole lot more money for materials fees than you could have with a speaking fee or from a combo. If you teach at a college, as I have, you might want to think about this. Um, I bring in my own books as the textbooks. And you can walk out with several hundred dollars for a class. If a textbook is going to be written or used, Use the one that is really tailored um, to that. So this becomes not only your marketing tool and your business card. Think of it as a business card, except it doesn't get tossed. Think of it as your marketing brochure, all of these kinds of things. Um, and the value of it for a buck fifty, you tell me if any magnet is going to do that for you. Okay. So I wanted to end with that impassioned, you know, write your book, please, please, the world is waiting. Um, the world isn't waiting, but the world does expect you to be a good person, to be kind. And I think books should have kindness and should come from that um, place. So that's my big ending, but um, we're at uh, the end here. I am happy to answer any questions. I'm not in a rush. So I, um, the thing I ask in case you are leaving is if you could just fill this out for me. So um, that would be very helpful. These are for you um, in case you start doubting yourself. Um, just take a peek at, at this. That's sort of my philosophy of, of writing and the myths we sometimes um, live by.